Well, this morning we uh, want to talk about Thanksgiving, and I want you to turn to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, and I'll be there in just a moment. Years ago, there was a great Civil War movie. I don't know whether you've seen it or not. It's one of my favorites. It's called Shenandoah. And Jimmy Stewart plays the widowed father of a large farm family. He plays a cranky old guy with a keen sense of self-sufficiency. And at the very beginning of the film, he's praying at a family meal. And he, he did that at every meal. He prayed at every meal because his wife, before she died, she was a Christian. She said, you at least pray for every meal. And so he was, he was praying. And as the film opens, he's praying at this meal, but it's a rather testy prayer. Now, I won't try to pray it the way Jimmy would, but you can just imagine as he said these words. He said, Lord, we cleared this land. We plowed it, we planted it, we harvested the crops, and we fixed the food. We worked till we were dog bone tired. None of this would be here if it weren't for us, but thank you anyway. Amen. Well, then the war came, and he lost everything. His family was ripped apart, brothers fought against brothers. His daughter gave birth to a child named after his wife, but died in childbirth. One of his sons was killed before his eyes. By a frightened young sentry, his youngest son, whom he loved dearly because the boy reminded him of his wife, gets carried off as a prisoner and lost for several years. Deep in the war, what's left of his family gathers around that same table. Seats are empty, but they're there for a meal. And Jimmy starts to pray the old prayer again. And here's what he says. He says, Lord, we cleared this land. We plowed it. But he chokes up and he can't go on. You see, suffering and loss had taken its toll. And the pain and the hurt now opened the door to gratitude. Toward the end of the movie, against all hope, Jimmy Stewart is sitting in church when his youngest son comes walking through the back door, limping down the aisle, and they all sing, all stand and sing the doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow. And the movie ends. Probably the single greatest speech ever given by an athlete was given by Yankee first baseman Lou Gehrig when he stood at the microphone at Yankee Stadium on a day when they honored him for his career. But he surprised everyone. He was suffering from a horrible disease that would ultimately take his life just a few months later. But he took the time to thank the fans and the vendors and the ticket takers and the workers who never got applause but made his job possible. And then he uttered the words that still echo today, and I quote, Today I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. And I ask you this morning, how in the world can someone be grateful and thankful in the midst of such suffering? In Luke chapter 17, we come to the final months of Jesus' life. He's on his way to Jerusalem one final time. And on this last trip to Jerusalem, he will go through Jericho. Luke records five miracles in his gospel account. The fifth and final miracle will take place in chapter 19 when Jesus will heal a blind beggar sitting by the roadside. Now Mark's account and Luke's account say there was one blind man. Matthew says there were two blind men and that Bartimaeus was the spokesman for the two. It's the same account. But here in Luke 17, we see the fourth miracle that Luke records. And the situation surrounding this miraculous event sets the stage for the most unusual Thanksgiving story you've ever heard. And with that background, would you stand for the reading of the word this morning? Luke chapter 17, beginning in verse 11. We come this morning to the story of the ten lepers. On the way to Jerusalem, the Bible says, he was passing them along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? 
And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the most unusual Thanksgiving story in all the Bible. And it will probably change your life. You may be seated and may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now, no one associates Thanksgiving with leprosy. No one. We think of turkey and dressing and pilgrims and pumpkin pie and football and family reunions and weird relatives. But no one thinks about leprosy. But maybe we should. In Luke 5, Jesus healed a leper and told him not to tell anyone. Apparently, that man couldn't keep the word of his healing quiet, and word spread like wildfire about Jesus and his power over sickness and his power over disease. The miracle here in Luke 17 involves 10 lepers. It was a demonstration of divine power that was overwhelming and undeniable and unmistakable. By the way, the Jews and the Jewish leaders not one time tried to deny the power of Jesus Christ. You know why? They couldn't. Now, lepers were the outcasts of society. Verse 12 tells us they stood at a distance. Lepers were to be avoided at all costs. They were outcasts. They were, they were outsiders. They were allowed to come inside the city wall to beg for food and for money, but at nighttime, they had to go outside the city. They, they could not spend the night there, and no one was to associate them, and absolutely no one was to touch them. People of Jesus' day had the misconception that Sickness was the result of sin, and so someone who had leprosy was considered to be under severe judgment from a holy God. The lepers lived their entire lives as strangers, even from their own family, even from their old friends. The only people they could associate with were other lepers. They lived their lives believing they'd been cursed by God and faced the daily scourge of being cursed by men. Dr. Paul Brand is world-renowned as an expert on leprosy, and he gives us some significant insight in a sort of up-to-date look at this disease. They call it Hansen's disease now. It's a cruel disease, not at all like other diseases. It primarily acts as an anesthetic, numbing the pain cells of the hands and the feet, the nose, the eyes, the ears. Not so bad, really, one might think. Most diseases are felt because of their pain. So what makes a painless disease so horrible? Hansen's disease has a numbing quality that is precisely the reason why it's so horrible. For thousands of years, people thought this disease caused the ulcers on hands and feet and face, which eventually led to rotting flesh and loss of limbs. But mainly through Dr. Brand's research, it has been established that in 99% of the cases, Hansen's disease only numbs the extremities. The destruction that follows comes solely because the warning system of pain is gone. Basically, people destroy their own limbs. How does the decay happen? In villages of Africa and Asia, a person with Hansen's disease has been known to reach directly into a charcoal fire to retrieve a dropped potato. Nothing in his body tells him not to. Patients at Brand's Hospital in India would work all day gripping a shovel with a protruding nail or extinguish a burning wick with their bare hands or walk on splintered glass and never know. Watching them, Brand began formulating his radical theory that Hansen's disease was chiefly anesthetic and only indirectly a destroyer. On one occasion, he tried to open the door of a little storeroom, but a rusty padlock would not yield. A patient, an undersized, malnourished 10-year-old, approached him, smiling. Let me try, Sahib doctor, he offered. And he reached for the key, and with a quick jerk of his hand, he turned the key in the rusty lock, and Bran was dumbfounded. How could this weak youngster show more strength than him? His eyes caught a telltale clue. Was that a drop of blood on the floor? Upon examining the boy's fingers, Bran discovered the act of turning the key had gashed his finger open to the bone. Skin and fat and joint were all exposed, yet the boy was completely unaware of it. 
The daily routine of life grinds away at the Hansen's disease patient's hands and feet. No warning system alerts them. If an ankle is turned or a tendon torn or muscle is ruined, he just, they just adjust and walk crooked. If a rat chews off a finger in the night, they won't even discover it missing until the next morning, and, and the sad story goes on and on. Stanley Stein went blind because of another quirk of Hansen's disease. Each morning he would wash his face with a hot washcloth, but neither his hand nor his face was sensitive enough to temperature to warn him that he was actually scalding himself, destroying his own eyes. That's how it worked. The disease went from 10 to 30 years, with victims usually dying from low resistance, other diseases, or infections. It can be easily translated by inhalation or bodily contact, or even contact with someone's clothing, which is why the Bible in Leviticus chapter 13 prescribes that you're not to touch the clothing of a leper. Since 1982, just so you know, there has been an effective treatment that can kill this bacterium that causes Hansen's disease. But still, there are probably a million and a half cases around the world this morning, mostly in third world countries, where they don't have that kind of protection. This disease is still with us. In biblical times, the effect was so severe, the potential for wiping out a population so great, that God laid down specific prescriptions. Command the children of Israel that they put out of the camp every leper Put him out. This is too horrific. This is too horrible to leave these people in any proximity to the healthy. God even used leprosy as a punishment on occasion. The Jews had a reason that they saw it as a curse of God. Naaman was a leper by divine punishment. Uz or Uzziah was a leper by divine punishment. Being a leper was the worst, and they had lots of lepers in Israel. Luke chapter 4, verse 27 tells us that. There were many lepers in the day of Elijah and Elisha, obviously, and there were many during the days of Jesus. Religiously, socially defiled in every way, no family, no friends, no job, no worship, no hope. They were walking illustrations of sin. They were walking illustrations of divine judgment. They led horrific lives. So little wonder when Jesus came to their village, they cried out to him collectively. Verse 12 tells us these 10 lepers stood at a distance and they lifted up their voices and they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Now I love this. They, uh, they recognized he was Lord. They acknowledged his power. Now you and I both know people today that we would we would mark off the list as being healthy. But they're not smart enough to know Jesus is Lord. And they don't, they're not wise enough to know his power, but they, they knew that. No doubt they were aware of others that he had healed. And back in Luke 5, Jesus literally went to that leper and he touched him. But in this situation, he simply says, go and show yourselves to the priest. And verse 14 says, and as they went, they were cleansed. I want to call your attention to one of those lepers. We meet him in verse 15. Luke says, then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back. Why did he turn back? Luke says he was doing three things. Number one, he was praising God with a loud voice. Verse 15. Number two, he fell at his feet. At, at Jesus' feet, he fell at his feet and just on his face before God, verse 16. And thirdly, he was giving him thanks. He was praising him. He was worshiping him. He was thanking him. You see, he wanted something more than just a physical healing. Notice this leper now has a new body. Luke says he was praising God with a loud voice. Now, for years he couldn't do that as a leper. Leprosy destroyed your larynx and your vocal cords, and, and, and you, most lepers could just barely talk a raspy, whispery voice. But now he could shout, and he has something to shout about. You know, I think it's sad that we don't shout more our love for God. 
You know, too many Christians go through life and, and, and many people around them never even know they're Christians. People ought to know. I remember being at Promise Keepers years ago and Brian Carter and I were sitting in the huge stadium of people and all of a sudden out of nowhere, a, a fellow way up on the top with his hands raised just started shouting hallelujah, praise God. And Brian and I both thought, you know, that's probably someone that's been forgiven of a lot of stuff. He's got a lot to shout about. He shouted in a loud voice, praising God. He turned back to Jesus, and at the top of his lungs, he is praising him and glorifying him. He has a new body. Secondly, Luke says he has a new heart. He fell at Jesus' feet. He takes the posture of a worshiper. No longer is Jesus just his healer. He's also his savior. He doesn't just glorify and praise God. He worships Jesus as God. Verse 16 says he was giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. More on that in a moment. In verse 17, Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? The Samaritan? Where are the nine? Well, they're probably on their way back to the priest. That's what Jesus told them to do. Well, why would they be going back to the priest? They were Jews. Jews would go back to the priest. Now, you've got to ask yourself this question. Well, what was this Samaritan doing hanging out with a bunch of Jews? They couldn't stand each other. Jews wouldn't even walk on Samaritan soil. If they got any dirt from Samaria on them, they'd wash themselves immediately. They, they were outcasts. You didn't touch them. You didn't talk to them. Why, is, why are they hanging out together? Well, he wasn't hanging out with a bunch of Jews, and they weren't hanging out with a Samaritan. They were lepers hanging out with lepers. That's all. The fact Jesus says, where are the nine, implies they should have been there as well. But they didn't have any interest in Jesus anymore. They got what they wanted. Like a lot of people today who are only interested in what Jesus can do for them. Bless me, burp me, help me, heal me, give me a new job, give me a raise, make me rich. And once they get that, they're gone. I don't know how many people I've watched over the years, and I've been doing it for a long time now. who the blessing of God forced them away from God, not the adversity of life, but the blessing of God, the very thing they prayed for, the very thing they wanted, and say, oh, God, if you bless me, I'll serve you and put you first, and so God blesses them, and then out the door they go, and they're gone. Listen, adversity is not the worst thing for us. In fact, in most cases, it's the best thing for us. It is prosperity and blessing that we struggle with. Because we forget the God who gives us every good and perfect gift from above. above. But notice this other leper. In fact, there's a Greek word there, alagenes. It means another race. Nobody came back except this Samaritan, this man of another race. I mean, you talk about an outcast. He was a Samaritan. He was a leper. He was from another race. Why does the Bible make a point of that? Remember John chapter 1, verse 11, where the Bible says, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. Jesus was a Jew. The Jews should have been the ones to come back. But He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. By the way, that same word, allogenes, was written on the outer wall of the temple, forbidding any foreigner from access to the temple areas reserved only for the Jews. Now, some of you Bible students know there was an outer court, a court of the Gentiles, but they couldn't go any farther into the temple. They weren't allowed. They were foreigners. But I want you to notice this foreigner, this Samaritan, who couldn't get into the temple area. He walks back into the presence of Jesus, and he stands face to face with God himself. He has his own personal holy of holies right there on a dusty road outside of Jericho. He had a new body. He had a new heart. He had a new future. Look at verse 19. And Jesus said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. And most people discount this passage as just another healing. 
That's not what happens here. It's not the word for healed here. Your faith has made you well. It's not the word for healed. It's not even the word for cleansed. The word here is sozo. It means salvation. You're saved. Jesus didn't just heal him of leprosy. He healed him of an even greater disease, sin. Do you need that healing this morning? Do you need the touch of Jesus in your life this morning? Years ago on a short-term missions trip, Pastor Jack Hinton from New Bern, North Carolina, was leading worship at a leper colony on the island of Tobago. There was time for one more song, so he asked if anyone had a request, and a woman who had been facing away from the pulpit turned around. It was the most hideous face I'd ever seen, Hinton said. The woman's nose and ears were entirely gone. The disease had destroyed her lips as well. And she lifted a fingerless hand in the air and asked, Can we sing, Count Your Many Blessings? Overcome with emotion, Hinton had to leave the service. He was followed by a team member who said, Jack, I I, I guess you'll never be able to sing that song again. Jack said, yes, I will, but I'll never sing it the same way. And my prayer is that after today, you'll never celebrate Thanksgiving the same way. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus.